Hi everybody, thank you for joining me as I continue to examine the books of Ray Comfort from my atheist perspective. In this video I will continue my examination of Ray Comfort's book, You Can Lead an Atheist to Evidence, But You Can't Make Him Think, and I will be looking at chapters 4 and 5 of that book. So let's begin right now with chapter 4, which is titled, Salvation in Christ, The Promise of Heaven and Eternal Life. Ray opens this chapter by lamenting how frustrating it is to deal with atheists. It's so obvious, he says, that God exists, that we all need salvation from hell, and that Jesus is the only way to get that salvation, and yet so many people can't or won't see those self-evident truths. Ray says that it's heartbreaking. Quote, such craziness wants me to throw up my hands in despair and then wash them of anything to do with atheism. But I can't. Compassion won't let me. I thank God for the love and concern that he places in those who trust him. Without it, I'm not sure I would even care about the salvation of anyone but myself and my immediate family and friends. Thanks, God. Also, remember, everybody, you're only a good person because God makes you a good person. Ray Comfort doesn't care about atheists or presumably anyone else because of any compassion or empathy innate to himself. It's that God is using the Holy Spirit to force him to care. All the good things about you, the decency, the kindness, the concern for others, are on loan from God. You yourself are a filthy, selfish, evil creature who deserves nothing but eternal punishment just for being here. Oh, also you were made in the image of God, and he loves you. Okay? Ray addresses the issue of why an omnipotent God would even need to go through the motions of the sacrifice of Christ in order to forgive us our sins, if that's what he wanted to do. The answer is, according to Ray, we have broken God's moral law, and we deserve the ultimate punishment for breaking that law. We cannot pay God back for what we owe him, resulting from our transgressions of his moral law. The only one who could afford to pay for our sins was God himself. So that's what he did. Well, at least Ray didn't blatantly evade the question this time, as he has done so often in the previous chapters we've talked about. Though, his answer has more to do with the theological mechanics of Christian salvation, and not so much with why it was necessary, or why we should think of it as moral. Ray adds that because uh, God is of a perfect character, he has a perfect moral character, and he's perfectly just, uh, he could not have simply forgiven us. It just He was bound by his perfect moral character, that he had to hold us accountable for our, our transgressions of the moral law. Um, and he must have retribution for our disobedience, and, and he decided to take retribution on himself, I guess, uh, so he wouldn't have to take it on us. Real, mighty big of God to do that. Um, I find it interesting, I find it noteworthy that in this conception of perfect justice, according to Ray Comfort, that there is no component of mercy or compassion whatsoever. Perfect justice, according to Ray Comfort, and apparently according to God, is just strict, blind legalism. So it's good to know that, in case you were ever wondering what the concept of perfect justice entailed. Also, apparently God's undeniable need for retribution, which is so undeniable that he, he can't even, he's not even able to just forgive people their sins. We must be made to suffer for our sins. Um, that, that need for retribution, so overwhelming, but not so overwhelming that it couldn't be satisfied by the phony bit of theater that was the sacrifice of Christ, at least when looked at from God's perspective. Ray Comfort and other apologists often scold critics of Christianity to remember that ultimately it's not our point of view that matters, but God's. So let's look at the crucifixion from God's point of view. Jesus dies a physical death, but his immortal soul continues to exist the entire time. So he never actually dies at all. 
And not only that, Jesus returns to physical life within a matter of days, thus negating the sacrifice of his body as well. So there was no actual sacrifice. Nothing was actually lost. Nothing was even ever at risk from God's perspective. And yet we're supposed to believe that this bloody drama of human sacrifice was necessary before God could forgive people their sins. And not only that, but it's also necessary for us to affirm that human sacrifice and implicate ourselves in the death of Jesus before we can have that forgiveness. Believe in and celebrate the imaginary sacrifice of Christ or go to hell. This is the arrogant, petulant demand made of all of us by the supposedly all-powerful, all-loving, all-just God of Ray Comfort. Ray says, in response to another question from uh, his blog, which again is the, the gimmick of this book, he's responding to, to uh, comments left on his blog, uh, he's, he's talking about the subject of uh, whether or not God hears our prayers. And he says that while God hears everything, the Bible tells us that he takes no notice of the prayers of those who cling to their sin. God only takes notice of humble prayers. Right, because he wants you on your knees begging for it. Because he is a just and loving God. Ray grapples with the question of whether repentance and faith come from God or if people have to come to these things on their own. Since the Bible seems to suggest both in various verses, Ray decides that he doesn't know, but he's sure that we're on the hook no matter what. Yes, whatever you do, don't acknowledge a possible contradiction in the Bible. Even if you can't reconcile it, just assume there's an answer God's not telling you. Because doubt is a sin and an insult to God, after all, and you don't want to piss him off. Why can't God change gay people who want to change? A blog comment asks. Because, Ray says, people shouldn't come to God because they have problems that they need fixed. They should come to God to be saved from sin. The church does people a disservice, Ray says, when they promise that coming to Jesus will fix people's problems and make them happy. And Ray says on this subject, quote, Around 90% who come to Christ for those reasons fall away from the faith. My book, The Way of the Master, has two pages filled with examples of the 90% fall away statistic. Two pages? If you come to look for God for the right reason, if you give yourself to God because you want salvation, you come in faith and repentance, then he can fix up gay people just fine. Ray says, quote, he puts a new spirit within them and gives them a heart with new desires. Thousands of ex-gays attest to the power of God to change lives. And the overwhelming consensus of modern psychology attests to the fact that ex-gay isn't actually a thing and that so-called reparative therapies designed to fix gay people are useless at best and highly damaging at worst. So, Ray, for helping to perpetuate the destructive, bigoted, dehumanizing concepts of ex-gay and reparative therapy, fuck you. Staying on the subject of homosexuality, Ray says he doesn't believe people choose to be gay, that it's more like homosexuality is just one possible result of the sinful nature that we're all born to, and it's more like people just choose that particular path of sin. But we're all sinners. Uh, gay people have just chosen to follow the gay sinful path as opposed to the other ones. Uh, but the good news is Jesus can save you, etc., etc., etc. So if any of you are taking notes, go ahead and just underline that fuck you from a second ago. New chapter section titled The Promise of Heaven. What's the deal with heaven anyway? What's it like? What goes on there? Where is it located? Ray admits that he used to find the concept of heaven ridiculous. Then he was saved, and he changed his mind. And Ray notes that he changed his mind for the same reason science changes its mind. He got new information. I thought science changing its mind was bad. 
Remember, Ray, when you brought up the revisions of the estimate of the age of the Earth over the last century, and you made it sound like science just couldn't make up its mind? But now you, you make it sound like a good and reasonable thing that science changes its estimates in the face of new data. Did you, did you notice that? When you were writing the book, oh, Christ, you're such an idiot. You're, you're so dumb that I would feel bad for you if you weren't also such an asshole. Anyway, when Ray got saved, he realized that heaven could exist because it was supernatural. He then compares radio waves, which are a real thing, to heaven, which is an imaginary place, and says that uh, just as with radio, we can know heaven is there if we have the proper receiver. And when we get saved through Christ, our receivers are plugged in, so to speak. Also, Ray doesn't know or even particularly care where heaven is located, but he knows that eventually it will be located right here on earth because the Bible says that God will set up his kingdom here on earth and will reign for all eternity. What will this kingdom be like? According to the Bible, God is going to get rid of the sea. So... That's one thing. And Ray figures that since God is light, he'll get rid of the sun, too, because at that point the sun will just be redundant. Quote, No enjoyment on this sad old earth has come even close to the unending pleasures that God has prepared for those that love him. This is the teaching of the Bible, and you are going to miss out simply because you refuse to change your mind, repent, and trust the Savior. Well, maybe. Or maybe because I don't think the Savior exists, or because even if he did, I would be incapable of involving myself in anything so grotesquely immoral as Christian salvation, or of worshiping a God as petty and cruel and stupid as the one in the Bible. There are also those factors to consider when dealing with the subject of why I'm not going to heaven. So, God's going to get rid of the sea. Sounds great, <laughs> doesn't it? Uh, and no more sun, either. I notice Ray's model of God's kingdom on Earth doesn't take much account of the rest of the fucking universe. Which makes sense, in a way, because it's based on the Bible, which also makes no accounting for the rest of the fucking universe. But, you know, from Ray's description, I mean, it sounds like Earth and Heaven are the only two places there are, which would make this pretty much the same scientifically ignorant, anthropocentric bullshit that people believed a, a thousand years ago. <laughs> but that would be foolish, <laughs> wouldn't it? A commenter complains about the no seas in Heaven thing, and also about getting a perfect body in heaven, uh, but not being able to feel lust, and therefore not being able to take advantage of the perfect body. Ray says that heaven could still have lakes, even though there won't be a sea for some reason. And then he chides the questioner for being driven by his sexual perversions. Yes, this exchange consisted of one adult addressing another adult, in an economically, socially, and scientifically advanced nation in the 21st century, just in case you were wondering. A commenter suggests that Christians like Ray are so taken with the prospect of the world to come that they don't really care about the world that we have right now. Ray counters that the only answer to many of the problems with the world we have right now, such as natural disasters, is for God to come in and put everything right. And he also insists that he does have love for the natural world. For instance, he likes trees because they are great for making houses. Yeah, <laughs> you know, they're also great for maintaining the atmosphere that allows us and countless other living things to breathe. But sure, houses, houses are nice too. Considering natural disasters to be problems that need fixing is another indication, as if that trees make great houses thing wasn't enough of an indication, of Ray's primitive, selfish, anthropocentric perspective. A more mature, reasonable view might be to say that 
While such things can be disruptive, dangerous, and highly destructive to us and our way of life, they are also a natural part of life on this planet. And there's nothing broken or evil or in need of fixing about them. Something that is bad for us is bad for us, not absolutely bad. Ray finishes up the chapter responding to a comment asking about why evangelism is needed in a world that is ruled by a supernatural God who offers supernatural salvation. Ray's response? A complete non sequitur about the importance of different churches getting along with one another. The disagreements among Arminianism and Calvinism will be resolved eventually as the Bible promises. Until then, Ray says, firefighters are here to fight fires, not each other. Again, the possibility that truly irreconcilable differences may exist due to errors or insufficiencies in the Bible is not considered even hypothetically. The Bible is perfect, it has to be perfect, and anything that makes it seem like it's less than perfect is just a question that God will answer when he's good and ready. An honest interpretation of the book is impossible when you start with that attitude. Chapter 5, The Testimony of Holy Scripture. Ray begins this chapter by lamenting the hypocrisy of televangelism and how the greed of those money-hungry preachers has robbed Christianity of credibility in the eyes of the doubting world. And if you want to learn more about how that greed and hypocrisy has infected the church, try one of the other dozens and dozens of slim, unnecessary cash-in books Ray Comfort has published. But while greed and hypocrisy is a problem with Christianity, fortunately, wisdom is not. At least not the wisdom of this world. Ray says, quote, So if you look around the Christian faith, you won't find many of those proud people who are puffed up in their own fleshly wisdom. In fact, if you look hard enough, you'll probably find a few more Christians like old Ray Comfort, who regard that so-called fleshly wisdom with suspicion and panic worthy of a 16th century witch hunter. Ray advises us that we should always consider biblical passages in context. Yes, quote mining is an inexcusable tactic, isn't it? And to remember that just because the Bible describes something, that doesn't mean that it is condoning that which it is describing. And that's a fair point, though I would argue that most of the most morally reprehensible acts described in the Bible, the genocidal flood of Noah, the divine command to slaughter the male Midianites and enslave the women, God's permission of the torments of Job, the supposedly righteous Lot offering up his daughters to be gang-raped, etc., plus the crucifixion salvation doctrine itself, are unambiguously condoned. Ray answers a blog comment about wisdom and God's apparent disdain for it by pointing out that God considers those who think of themselves as wise to be foolish because the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. But, Ray says, if you want to interpret that as meaning that God likes his followers dumb, then go for it. And he says, quote, But let me see if you are a wise person. Can you make honey from nothing? How about a glass of milk from nothing? How about a living leaf? Can you make a living frog or a cat, a horse or a cow from nothing? How about an eye? Make me a fully functioning eye using no materials. Can you? Of course you can't. All of which somehow speaks to one's level of wisdom, apparently. Can you make a glass of milk from nothing? No. Ha 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 ha! Stupid. Ray continues, quote, You don't even have an intelligent answer for how those came about. You would probably say that evolution is responsible for making everything, but that it didn't make it from nothing. It made it from gases in space. Well, as someone who took a first-year college biology course and therefore has a rudimentary understanding of the theory of evolution, no, I probably would not say that. 
However, if you want to change the subject to astronomy and cosmology and talk about stellar and planetary formation, then yeah, I guess gases in space is more or less acceptable as a very general sort of answer. Ray's not done yet, though. He's been putting me off with the short right, but he's about ready to bring that big left hook around. Hit me right here. Actually, it'd be, he'd hit me right here because he would be... Anyway, you get the point. Here it comes. Quote, Then where did the gases come from? You have to keep saying that there was something in the beginning because basic science says that nothing can come from nothing. Yep, you can't make a piece of sand from nothing. You don't know where we came from, why you are here, or what's going to happen after you die. You don't know much at all. So if it's true that God likes them dumb and ignorant, you sure qualify to be liked by him. Drops the mic, trips over the cord on his way off stage. Let's leave aside the fact that, thanks to science, we do have good answers for many of those questions Ray has thrown up as though they were unsolvable mysteries, and deal with this coldly and logically. Suppose we are totally in the dark about all of that. Suppose we have no idea where any of this came from, how it got here, how it works, any of that stuff. That counts zero in favor of Ray Comfort's proposed explanation, your memory of which I shall now refresh by reciting it in detail. God done it. Science has given us good answers for lots of questions that people have wondered about and struggled with for millennia, but even if that were not the case, it would not make Ray Comfort's religion true or the slightest bit more likely to be true. I don't know, but you don't know either, therefore I know is not a valid syllogism. Speaking of knowing stuff, how do we know the Bible is really the inspired Word of God? Do we have anything other than the Bible's own testimony about itself to establish this? And how do we reconcile differences between the Old Testament and the New? Ray responds by first going off on another tangent about how humanity has fallen and needs to trust in Jesus for salvation. And then uh, he compares the Bible to an instruction manual for an appliance. He says that, like that manual, you prove that the Bible's claims are true by testing them. The Bible says if you love God and trust Him, He will reveal Himself to you. So get on your knees, confess your sins, and give your heart to Jesus. And eventually, maybe not in this life, but eventually, all your questions, which will now be asked, Ray notes, in humble awe, will be answered. So, the answer to how do we know the Bible is really the Word of God is trust the Bible. And the answer to how do we reconcile the inconsistencies between the Old and New Testaments is trust the Bible. A blog comment asks how Ray responds to the suggestion that the Bible was written by crazy people and that only crazy people are capable of believing it. Ray says that his response to such a person would be to put aside the question of biblical inspiration and start preaching to that person instead. Jesus didn't command his followers to convince others that the Bible is the word of God. He commanded his followers to share the good news of salvation. Ray says, quote, Remember, early Christians weren't converted by the scriptures. Instead, they were saved by a spoken message. Most couldn't read anyway. The New Testament hadn't been compiled. There was no such thing as the printing press. Yes, and the Catholic Church banned the Bible pretty soon after they started printing them anyway. So, so the answer to how do we know the Bible wasn't written by crazy people, is smack that person in the head with a Bible. Ray responds to a comment from an atheist who has been researching the history of the Bible by suggesting that he also read the Bible itself. But, be sure you read the Bible the right way. Quote, There are two ways you can read the Bible. One is with the light off. By that I mean that you can read it with a proud heart, looking for mistakes, marking seeming contradictions, believing that you are intellectually superior to what you are reading. 
The second way is with the light on. By that I mean with a humble heart, believing that you don't know everything and that you could gain knowledge by studying the world's greatest selling book of all time. The world's greatest selling book bit is an irrelevant appeal to popularity. Ray frames it as a matter of humility, but I say it's actually a matter of credulity if you choose to study the Bible as Ray recommends or not. I used to have a copy of the New Testament that was an inexpensive paperback newsprint copy that I had picked up at the truck stop where I used to work. Someone had left it behind. And uh, there was a note printed on one of the first pages that basically told me to just read it, accept what it said, and don't ask any questions. And that is what Ray Comfort is telling us to do here. And to me, it's not a matter of putting yourself above the work you're studying. It's a matter of studying that work honestly and critically. If what the Bible says really is true, then its champions, like Ray Comfort, have nothing to fear from an honest, critical reading. Just read it and stop asking so many questions sounds insecure, and a little suspect. Didn't Jesus say it's impossible for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven? Yes, but the Bible also tells a story of a rich man who humbled himself and accepted Christ and was granted salvation, the same as anyone else would have been. So just make sure, if you're rich, to love God more than you love money. Loving other people <laughs> more than your money isn't important because once you join God's team, he'll make you love them. And he'll also want you to give 10% of your money, at least, to the guy who told you the story about how the rich man got into heaven. So look for that too. Ray reminds us that it's the love of money that is the root of all evil, which puts the stank on us for loving it, not on the money. The money is cool because, look, God sure seems to love it. But it's okay if God loves it. God's love of money is not the problem. It's our love of money that is the root of all evil because the rules don't apply to God. Except when they do. And he has to pretend to sacrifice himself in human form in order to forgive people's sins without breaking his own rules. Ray responds to an incredulous comment about the talking snake, Jonah living in the stomach of the fish, Jesus walking on water, with this, quote, So, a talking parrot? 300 people flying through the sky in a big tin can called a 747? A human being growing inside another person? And men walking on the moon? Don't contradict logic? No! For fuck's sake! You gibbering twat. No, they don't contradict logic. Not even a little. Not even slightly. Not even from certain perspectives. They don't contradict logic at all. Except for the moon landings, all of those things you mention in that quote are either natural or otherwise commonplace occurrences. And all of them, including the moon landings, are well-understood phenomena that operate in perfect accordance with the laws of physics. Our sound understanding of said laws being what made two of them, the airplane and the moon landings, possible in the first place. Ray goes on to say that uh, things like the talking snake and the miracles of Jesus only seem illogical to small-minded people who don't accept that the supernatural is a reality. And with the supernatural, it's no big deal for animals to talk and all these other seemingly impossible things to happen. But the reason most people who reject the supernatural reject the supernatural is because there isn't any evidence for the supernatural. There's no reason to think that the supernatural is real. And rejecting an extraordinary claim for lack of evidence doesn't indicate small-mindedness it indicates sound-mindedness. Finally, for this chapter anyway, Ray answers the question that I'm sure has been on all of your minds this entire time. Why does the Bible compare us to pigs? Ray responds with a condescending explanation of what a metaphor is, 
which the questioner who asked why the Bible compares us to pigs, not why the Bible says we are pigs, presumably knows already. Then Ray says that humans are like pigs because when you cast pearls before swine, they don't give a shit about the pearls, just as most of us don't care about the pearls offered to us in the form of the Bible. Ray says, quote, Yep, perfect analogy. The Bible takes the cake. It hits the nail on the head. By the way, never mix your metaphors. <laughs> and never read Ray Comfort while you have access to a gun, sharp objects, or a lethal amount of alcohol. For your own safety. That's it for this video. That's it for chapters 4 and 5. I will return in the next episode of this series to finish up with the first book in the series, because... Recall that this series will deal with two Ray Comfort books. In the next episode, I'll finish up uh, You Can Lead an Atheist to Evidence But You Can't Make Him Think by looking at Chapter 6, which is titled What Sets Christianity and Christians Apart, and Chapter 7, The Witness of Jesus Christ and of God's Holy Spirit. And I'll have some concluding thoughts on the book as well, and we'll transition into the next book, that will fill out the remaining six episodes of the series after next week, which is Ray Comfort's uh, God Doesn't Believe in Atheists. So, finish up the first book, get ready for the second book. That's the next episode. Thank you guys, as always, for watching. I do so appreciate that this is of interest and of use to you. Uh, leave a comment, ask me a question, amplify a point, agree with me, disagree with me. It's all good. I look forward to hearing from you, and I'll see you in the next episode.